Yeah, welcome to numerical methods. And we had a session on implementation of our numerical methods. So we are here, implementation, yeah, abstraction of the mathematical concepts. And as I already mentioned, this is also a part of the lecture. I like to teach you becoming a good programmer, yeah, improving your programming style. So pointing to a few aspects. And by doing this, we also build now, you know, say a laboratory where we can later build upon and run experiments. Yeah, so we will create reusable code yeah, for our numerical methods that we have considered so far. Let me do a short recapitulation because these things will appear again. Yeah, three design principles were already highlighted. So we should cut our interfaces at the right boundaries. Yeah? So there is the so-called uh, single responsibility principle that a module yeah, should be responsible for one aspect to one actor. We could maybe interpret this as uh, implementing one mathematical method yeah, in a dedicated model and not put everything uh, together. On the other hand, there is a force that is pulling in the opposite direction, and that is that you should keep things close together that have a strong dependency. Yeah, So this is called uh, cohesion. And I already gave you an example, and we will see this today, that, for example, in our models, where we discretize um, a stochastic differential equation that is modeling, um, for example, an asset, there is the measure, the equivalent martingale measure, and the numeraire. And the measure yeah, determines the drift. Yeah? So there is Gesanov uh, theorem, a change of measure yeah, is associated with a change of the drift. And the measure is associated with the numeraire. So the two components, numeraire and drift, they depend on each other. You don't see this so much in models for stocks, yeah, in equity models like Black Schultz model or Heston model, because there the numeraire is always the bank account. And you don't see this technique of change of numeraire um, if you start studying uh, these things by looking at these models. But if you look at interest rate models, you will immediately see that there are different choices of a numeraire. And I also have today an example where you can choose a different numeraire for, for example, the Black Schultz model. And um, a third aspect that I would also highlight is uh, design uh, for uh, extension. So what we have done in the uh, previous uh, session was to look at these things a little bit from uh, our application. Yeah? So for example, the valuation of a European call option under the Black Shorts model. Yeah? That was uh, one application. So we had here a code session yeah, where we implemented a Monte Carlo valuation of a European option under the Black Shorts model. And also yeah, study uh, where we could uh, cut our yeah, methods that we need to uh, implement this. So here for this, there was um, a code, our Monte Carlo Black Scholes call option experiment in our lecture repository. So let's shortly look at that one again. So this was here, our Monte Carlo Black Scholes call option experiment. So there was um, a model, uh, a Black Scholes model, the model parameters. There was a financial product, a European option, product parameters here. Um, we were doing time discretization. Well, in that case for the Black Scholes model, we know the exact solution. So we could do one single time step. Later, I will generalize this to an Euler scheme. Yeah, so time discretization was not so important here. And then we did a Monte Carlo sampling of the random variables. So our random number generator had a certain seed and a certain number of sample path. So we had different implementations and that's maybe here the 
straightforward one. Yeah, you implement a loop or loop over all sample paths, and then you generate your uniform distributed random number from that, the normal distributed random number that you plug in in your Black Scholes model solution to generate the stock, that you plug in in your financial product to generate the payoff random variable. Yeah, then you take from that the discounted value and the expectation. That, that's it. So starting from this application, we already created interfaces for the objects that we use, and we looked at some implementations. For example, there was the random variable. Yeah, we often work with random variable and inside the implementation of the random variable so we had here two implementations one using double precision floating num point numbers one using single precision floating point numbers inside uh, there was this uh, yeah loop that when we add two random variables these operations are often element wise so there was this loop yeah loop over all elements yeah sum them together this gives the, the next element yeah so do a, an element wise addition an element wise uh, multiplication but also in this implementation there was for example the kahan summation when we calculate the expectation yeah the sum and divide by the number of sample points so already there uh one numerical method we had in our very first sessions on computer arithmetic. We will need a time discretization when we discuss the Euler scheme. Yeah? So we had an interface that provides a time discretization and provides some convenient method. Like for example, uh, give me for a given time, uh, the nearest time point in your time discretization yeah? or the nearest one yeah, that is uh, larger or equal to that one. Um, so rounding to the next largest time point or rounding down to the next smallest time point. So such an implementation was here in time discretization from array. So you just pass an array, for example, but also this thing had convenient constructors. Yeah, You just pass the initial uh, time point the time step size and the number of time steps you would like to have, and he generates the time discretization. Yeah, from the time discretization and a random number generator, for which we already had this concept of providing an interface, yeah, our random number generator 1D, yeah, or the random number generator in higher dimensions, the Mersenne Twister as an implementation of the random number generator. So from the time discretization and the random number generator, we could create a Brownian motion. So a family of normal distributed random variables, or here actually a family of samples yeah, of such normal distributed random variables. So you see the return value of my Brownian motion is already an object yeah, of the type random variable. And we had two implementations here, yeah, one using Mesa Twister and the other one using a generic random number generator provided to the Brownian motion so that, for example, you could also use the quasi Monte Carlo method by providing a Horton sequence with the appropriate dimension to the Brownian motion. So that was what we did in the last session. And then we ended a little bit in the second part of our code session, the Monte Carlo valuation of the European option under the Black Scholes model. So we could go back here to the code and we had different versions. So, so that one here was the plain and simple version that was using here this loop. Let's fold this together. Then I also had a version that you was using the stream API and yeah, double unary operators with was a little bit cleaner yeah, in the sense that you really see here the model and the product, yeah, then the random number generator generating uniform sequences, normal distributing to sequences, sequences of the stock, sequences of the payoff, yeah, and then you just take the average of the elements of this sequence. Okay, and now the one that uses our interfaces and the implementation of these interfaces. 
So you see, I use here a technique that is called um, implementing against the interface. So uh, you always see on the left-hand side, the name of the interface. So time discretization is an object of the type time discretization. And then I initialize this on the right-hand side using the specific class, yeah, the specific implementation. This means that if you write it like this, I mean, an alternative form to write this would be to write this guy on the left-hand side. Yeah? But if you write it like this, it means that this variable here is only known to be of the type of that interface, which means all the stuff that comes below can only use the knowledge provided by this interface and not something special provided by this implementation. This makes it very easy to say, for example, replace here this generation of the time discretization yeah, or here the generation of the Brownian motion. Yeah? You see the same principle here. Brownian motion yeah, is the interface. Brownian motion from random number generator is the implementation. Also here, I use a mass and twister as a random number generator. So that is uh, using now the time discretization, the Brownian motion. The return value of my Brownian motion is a random variable. Okay, and now I can actually calculate with these random variables. You see there's no for loop here over all the samples, yeah, like we did here. This loop is missing because now all the operation is done on the random variable. Yeah, your Brownian increment is multiplied with sigma. Okay, this is the diffusion, and then to the diffusion, you add the drift, yeah? the mu delta t. Yeah, since we just do one time step, it is mu times capital T, okay? Then the exact solution is the exponential of that multiply with the initial value, yeah? So all these operations here are operations on random variables. So that we spare this loop, yeah? So this here is the stock, yeah? Then we plug the stock into the option payoff, yeah? So su subtract the K, take the maximum of that and zero, yeah? multiply with the discount factor, and then we take the expectation. So that was what we did so far. We can run this little experiment. You see our analytic value, the value using Monte Carlo using the for loop, the value using the Java stream API, and the value using our objects. So, and although we make these calculations here with random variables, which look a little bit less efficient, you see that we are not so much slower yeah, than compared to this thing where we do it in the loop, and we are even faster than the stream API. And also you see that this here is the Monte Carlo value using this loop, and this here is the Monte Carlo value using the stream API. This is because the stream API in, his, in this summation if you look here in the summation method, this has an error correction. Yeah, So you see this here, they write this here. This method may be implemented using compensated summation or other techniques to reduce the error. So indeed they did it. And so they did a kind of Kahn summation like we do. Yeah, That's the reason why we get the same value if we now operate on our random variable and just call here the method expectation. So these are now our building blocks. And now I would like to move to creating ETO stochastic processes yeah, out of our building blocks. So what are the ETO stochastic processes built out of these blocks? We have a time discretization. We have, for example, the Euler scheme. So the Euler scheme takes as an input exactly the things for which we created already implementations and interfaces. So the Euler scheme takes a time discretization and Brownian increments to create a time discrete stochastic process out of yeah, a model specification. So there is an ETO stochastic process that is actually specified here by its coefficient and its initial value. 
you know? So I need to have a specification of the model quantities to then generate the random variables that define the time discretized approximation of our uh, stochastic process. So this is what I would like to do. I would like to have now uh, a class implementing the Euler scheme for a given model specification. Okay, there you already see what is maybe a good boundary yeah, where you should decouple the implementation. We would like to have many different models yeah, in later sessions. Yeah? I will have a Black schultz model, a Bachelier model, a Heston model, yeah? a one with stochastic volatility. So now comes design for extension. So when we think now about implementing the Euler scheme, we should think a little bit about design for extension. Maybe already thinking about Black schultz model and Bachelier model is interesting. Yeah. So this is the difference between the two models. And in the Black Schultz model, you can get the exact discretization scheme by moving to the logarithm of S. Yeah? You can make it in a different state variable, namely Y equals logarithm of S yeah? in a different state variable. You can make this an etostochastic process with constant coefficients which is very nice yeah, for the Euler scheme because it then has no discretization error. For the Bachelier model, moving to the logarithm does not make sense. So actually you can remove here this part by moving to a different state variable yeah, where you just multiply with an e to the rt yeah, and the chain rule gives you then um, this, this part. Yeah. So for the Bachelier model, you would not move to the logarithm. So already thinking about these things, we see that maybe for different models, we would like to have an Euler scheme applied to different state variables. So there is an additional thing that is somehow a transformation of the state variable to the quantity that we discretize, and then the back transformation from the quantity that we have discretized to the quantity that we would like to use. So I have something that I could call, say, a generalized Euler scheme for ETO stochastic processes. And this generalized Euler scheme now discretizes here my model. So this is here my model, dx is mu x dt plus sigma x dw, the initial value of x is x zero. But it does this by moving to a different state variable and applying the Euler scheme to the state variable y. Yeah? So there is a state variable y here, and we would now like to have an Euler scheme for this state variable y. So for the Black-Scholes, this function g would be, for example, the logarithm of x of t. That means, once you have discretized your y to have the random variable y tilde, you now apply the inverse of the g, the f, in our case for the Black Schultz model, this would be the exponential to this state variable y, which will then give you the variable x. So to y tilde because we have performed a time discrete approximation y tilde of the y and we transform back to the state yeah, x. Yeah, so have the time discrete approximation x tilde of the original x. So there is something which I call um, a state space uh, transform. And of course this transformation will change the drift of my stochastic process Y according to Ito's lemma. Yeah? So now you have to apply Ito's lemma to get the stochastic process for Y. 
Yeah? So you have the stochastic process for Y. So the stochastic process for Y has a different drift, say, let's call that mu Y dt plus sigma Y dw. Yeah? So for the black Schultz model, the sigma Y yeah, would be the sigma X divided by S. Yeah? The S would be removed. And the mu y yeah, would be the mu x, yeah, the rs, divided by s, minus one half sigma squared. So I define now my generalized Euler scheme for Ito stochastic processes. So my model is specified in terms of the process y that I would like to discretize. So we provide y, and instead of sigma, I now write lambda. So the mu here is the mu belonging to y. Yeah, so that's maybe an important remark. Yeah? So these guys here are the coefficients of y. So the mu is the drift. And the lambda, this I call the factor loadings. Yeah, okay, this I call factor loadings because I'm designing it for extension also in a different aspect. This dot here, this is a scalar product. Because the Brownian increment here is an m vector and my random variable y this is an n vector. So I'm immediately considering vector valued stochastic processes because Black Schultz model would do just a scalar one, but Heston model would also have a stochastic volatility. It already had two dimensions. Yeah? And Heston model can be driven by two Brownian increments, by two independent components of the Brownian motion. Yeah? So you can have multiple components of the Brownian motion here. So if this is an M vector and my state space is an N vector, okay, this here is then an uh, N by M uh, matrix. So I specify my stochastic process now in terms of the Y. Yeah, this is my hidden state space. For the Black Schultz model, it would be the logarithm of the stock. Uh, of course, my y has an initial value, say here y0. And then I have a state space transform that transforms the value y to the object of interest. So that is my x. So there is another thing here that also belongs to my model. And this is my state space transform. Yeah. For the Black Schultz model, it is just the exponential function. Yeah, of course, there is a relation between the drift mu and your state space transform yeah, via Eto's lemma. Yeah? If f is the exponential, then in the drift mu, you would have this minus one half sigma squared. Yeah? That's the reason why I specified the drift for the y process and the state space transform. And now you see that these ingredients here completely describe my model. Huh? So what is the underlying state space process? What is the transformation? So maybe we call this the process model and that's our first interface. So I call this the process model. The model for our time discrete stochastic process, yeah, the model that will be consumed by the Euler scheme to create the time discrete uh, stochastic process. So now comes what we already have, time discretization. So here we have our interface time discretization. And our Brownian motion on that time discretization that provides the Brownian increments. So 
such that if we now put these things together, the time discretization, the Brownian motion, and our model, then we have enough input to create the time discrete stochastic process using the Euler scheme. So we will use the Euler scheme on the state space Y. Yeah. These create a family of random variables. Yeah. So next value is previous value. Yeah. Then plus our model parameter mu multiplied with the time discretization time step size plus our model parameters lambda multiplied with the Brownian increments. So these create now families of random variables. So you see these operations here that are in this line are all operations on random variables. This is our other interface. And this rule is implemented by by the Euler scheme, where the Euler scheme also makes the corresponding back transformation. So the Euler scheme also applies from our model. Yeah, it has the model as an input, the F to the time discretized process Y to the Y tilde yeah, to get the random variable X tilde. So all this is now part of our implementation of the Euler scheme. Yeah, this is also an interface. It is the interface that is providing these quantities here. So it is providing the time discrete stochastic process. So three things are already there. Yeah. We have our time discretization, we have our Brownian motion, we have our implementation of the random variable, and two things we still have to do. Okay, so we have to define an interface that provides the model, and then we have to define an interface that provides the time discrete stochastic process. For example, by an Euler scheme using time discretization, Brownian motion, and model. Yeah? So since the time discretization is already part of the Brownian motion, yeah? we have a time discrete stochastic process with the Brownian motion. It provides the Brownian increments. We actually have two ingredients. Yeah? The model plus the Brownian motion are feed into the Euler scheme to create here this process. Maybe just recall, I made here this remark that this is a scalar product. I like to design for ex extension. So my stochastic process is an M factor process. So I call this an M factor process, so which means there is here a scalar product. So you have to interpret this as a matrix vector product. So I have a matrix lambda jk. And I have a vector of Brown increments, yeah, delta W K, and uh, lambda times delta W is then, of course, the vector, yeah, uh, sum K from one to M, lambda J K, delta W K, uh, and that's then the trace element of that vector. Yeah, this allows me to create very general models, yeah, because then we just feed in a lambda matrix, yeah, and we get, for example, an interest rate model, yeah, or um, um, generalization of the Black Scholes model where we have multiple assets, yeah, different stocks. The different stocks are driven by different Brownian motions. And this matrix then determines not only the volatility of the stocks, but also the covariance or correlations of the stocks. Uh, this will be uh, the instantaneous correlation of the Brownian driver. So example for the Black Scholes model, um, yeah, our model is like that, ds is r s dt plus sigma s dw, and the numerea is dn is rn uh, dt. Uh, initial value is initial value of the stock, initial value of the bank account. Uh, yeah, also recall here with the initial value, 
this here is the initial state of our hidden state variable. Yeah, but the initial state yeah, is, of course, just F inverse or our G yeah, applied to the initial value of the model. So if you have this generalized um, Euler scheme, how would we use that for the Black Scholes model? So our Black Scholes model just has a single Brownian driver here. So our stochastic process is a one factor process. So our Brownian motion is just using one factor. So there's just a scalar time discrete stochastic process. Our process is one dimensional. Yeah? So the D is equal to one. Yeah, the best way to discretize the Black Scholes model is due to the S here to move to a different state space, namely take the logarithm of S. Yeah? So we will discretize the logarithm of S. So our transformation is take the logarithm of S to discretize. So don't discretize the stock, discretize the logarithm of S. So if we don't discretize the stock, but we discretize the logarithm of S, this means from my state space variable back to the stock, I take the exponential. So my state space transform is then the exponential. Yeah, That is the state space transform. Of course, the initial state is then the logarithm of the initial value of the stock. Yeah? So this is the initial state of the Euler scheme. If I have moved to the logarithm, I apply Ito's lemma and it tells me that the drift of y, yeah? so my input is the drift of y, is r minus one half sigma squared. And my factor loading, so my lambda, my lambda matrix, but since I am one dimensional, one factorial, the lambda matrix is just a single lambda. This is just sigma. So these are here my model specifications that I will feed in now together with a Brownian motion into my Euler scheme. I would like to make a small remark. Um, our model should also provide the numeraire. So this links now to our remark on cohesion. The specification of the drift and the specification of the numeraire should be close to each other. Yeah. They should not be too decoupled to have inconsistent specifications. So since the drift is specified here in this blue box in my model, the model should also specify the numeraire. So maybe have that here. Yeah, so n, my numeraire is um, a function of time, yeah? But there's a subtle thing. If I would like to design this for extension, there are many models where the numeraire is a function of your state space variable. So is a function of X. So for example, in the LIBOR market model, an interest rate model, you are modeling interest rates. Interest rates are stochastic. Of course, then your bank account at a certain time is a random variable, is a stochastic process. Yeah, It depends on the interest rates that you have modeled. So for example, for the spot measure, yeah, it depends on all the past observations of the random variables. So it can have a quite complicated uh, dependency. So I have here the remark that there could be model quantities, functions that actually depend on the discretized stochastic process. You already have that in the drift. If you like to discretize Black Scholes model in the plain way by not going to the logarithm, yeah, your drift would be mu times s, yeah, and the lambda would be sigma times s. 
So you see that here, this guy is a function of the state that you are discretizing. So actually here I specify that I would like to specify the drift as a function of y. So in that case, if it is r times s, the y would be the x, and I just have the mu is r times y. Same happens to the numerator. The numerator may depend on the state spaces that we have discretized. Yeah? So the numerator is actually a, a function of all the process values. So since the numerator has to be measurable with respect to FTI, yeah, it can only depend on all the state spaces that have been simulated so far. So if we have our time discrete stochastic process, x tilde, it will depend on this x tilde. So let me add here an x tilde here. So it will depend on this Euler scheme, generalized Euler scheme approximation of our uh, stochastic process. Of course, then you only get out an n tilde, yeah, which is an approximation to your true uh, numerator. The important part is that the numerator may depend on the state space variable. So for that reason, I have to now have a strange circle. So now I have a strange circle. Yeah, uh, My Euler scheme here requires the model, the model parameters, yeah? but also the model when it provides the numerator, requires the Euler scheme. So how do I resolve this? Yeah, my stochastic discrete process is just an argument uh, to this uh, function. So we will see this when we now discuss the uh, implementation. So abstraction interfaces. Yeah, we had already the three ingredients, time discretization, Brownian motion, random variables. So the two things that we need is the specification of our model. So I will have an interface that is called process model. I have many different implementations, a Black Scholes model, a Bachelier model, a Heston model, and so on. So this process model provides the initial state, the drift, the factor loadings, the state space transform, and the numerator. And then I have an implementation called process, which provides the x tilde, the time discrete stochastic process on my time discretization. Now, this takes the process model as an input. It takes the Brownian motion as an input. Since the Brownian motion is already discretized, it knows the time discretization and it creates the time discrete stochastic process. For example, I have an implementation that implements an Euler scheme, but also a predictor corrector. Maybe we start by reviewing these classes by starting at the process, you know, the time discrete stochastic process, so the output. So we find this in here, our library, yeah, and then I have to move to Monte Carlo, so down here, Monte Carlo, there is model and process, so here is the process, and the process is just uh, the specification of the interface. So my time discrete stochastic process just provides me a random variable at a certain time index. Yeah? So since there is an associated time discretization, I can also ask this time discrete stochastic process for what is the time discretization, yeah? because I have to know which time corresponds to which time index. Yeah? And that's uh, more or less it. Yeah? You see, there's also some other stuff related to weight at Monte Carlo, but maybe we forget about this for a moment. So apart from that, yeah, that's not much more. And this is just the specification. I can provide you x tilde. I will be an Euler scheme, but I can provide you x tilde. I can provide you x tilde if you specify um, a model. So this process also may be associated with the model. There could be time discrete stochastic processes that are not generated out of a model. Yeah, in that case, I just return a null, but um, usually I'm associated with the process model. So the process model is now this other guy that is an input to my implementation of the Euler scheme later. Let's look at this 
interface because it is also an interface. So here you see, this is the specification of this interface and you see a lot of documentation here. Yeah, So this is here the Java doc. Yeah, You sometimes see a little bit HTML stuff or sometimes also LaTeX stuff. So you see, this is the stochastic process specification of the process X that is represented by a state space transform F applied to Y where dy is mu dt plus lambda dw. And you see that I already write here my m factorial process. So I have lambda 1j dw1 up to lambda mj dwm. Um, you see some examples yeah, for the back shorts model and so on. By the way, this is Java doc. And if you would like to see this, he is automatically generating web pages out of this. So I have a web page here for all these classes and you can now move to the Java doc documentation. So that was in Monte Carlo process. And now we are in model, the process model. And if you click here, then you see here this documentation that we just had in the code a little bit formatted uh, with a little bit nicer formatting. Yeah? And you see all the other models, for example, the Black Schultz models that are implementing this interface. Yeah? Here's the Black Schultz model. So let's have a look now at how this interface is described. Yeah? So there is an associated date. You can't forget about this. This is the dimension of my stochastic process. So this is the D. Yeah? Then I specify my state space transform. Yeah? So for a certain time index and for a certain element of my vector, yeah, I can transform now my state variable to the uh, x. Yeah? So this here is the state space transform. F is a function of yi. Also a bit nicer here in this documentation. Yeah? Apply state space transform. So this maps the y i to the xi. Could be that you provide an inverse for this. Yeah? And after that, we just have the initial state. This is the y0. We provide the numeraire. This is the n. We provide the drift, the drift of the y, the mu y. We provide the m, the number of factors. And we provide the factor loadings. So that's more or less it. And you also see that the numeraire is a function that takes as an argument the time discrete process. So my Euler scheme will use this model to discretize the x. And my numeraire is then a function that takes the time discretization and calculates the numeraire. So now let's have a look at what models implement this interface. So we take a look at the type hierarchy here. So you see, I have a few interest rate models here also, which you maybe will see in a different lecture. But here below we have, for example, Bachelier model, Black Scholz model in different versions, a displaced log normal model, a Hesse model, a Hull White model, which is also an interest rate model, and a Merton model, Weyens gamma model, and so on. Let's have a look at the Black Scholz model. So the Black Scholz model, yeah, written here, you can move to the web page. Yeah, it has parameters R, sigma, yeah, the initial value as zero. So initial value as zero, risk-free rate and volatility. Well, since I have designed everything for um, extension, all these guys are here random variables, so it's stored internally as random variables. But of course, you can call the constructor just with constants. Yeah. So initial value, risk-free rate, volatility. And then he will take um, a random variable implementation, for example, yeah, using here this random variable factory to create random variables out of this. So once we have wrapped these constants here into random variables, we can just return, we can just implement our model function, our interface functions. So what is the 
initial state. Yeah, the initial state we calculated upon construction is the logarithm of the initial value. What is the drift? Yeah, implementation of the get drift function returns the drift. The drift is also just a constant. It is calculated upon construction and it is r minus one half sigma squared. So from that, you already see that my state space transform has to be the exponential. So let's have a look. Where is the state space transform? It is the exponential function. So I'm implementing now the Black Schultz model by discretizing the logarithm of S. So I have this state space transform. Yeah, and the factor loadings, if I have moved to the logarithm, uh, the factor loadings here, they are calculated as just the sigma. So this is now my Black Schultz model. You could also have a look to the Bachelier model. And for the Bachelier model, you see that the state space transform is not take the logarithm. Yeah, It's actually just take the random variable as it is, but it multiplies the random variable with an e to the rt yeah, to remove the rsdt part. So we first transform to a state variable where ds is just sigma dw, and then we discretize that one. So you have a completely different state space transform. The factor loadings are just uh, volatility. Uh, and since we have transformed the drift to a zero, the drift is just a zero. So a very different way now um, of providing this model. And also this way of discretizing the Bachelier model gives you an exact discretization in the Euler scheme. So we, were, we make very nicely use here of the model specification. I also have some more complicated models, for example, here the Heston model. Yeah? So here's the documentation, maybe nicer in the Java doc web page. So let's move to the Heston model. So you see, this is a model where you have a stochastic volatility. So the sigma is actually the square root of the V and the DV is a stochastic process of its own. So the number of components in the Heston model is actually two. Uh, so you see, it has two components. So I have two components. One is the stock and one is the squared of the stochastic volatility, yeah, the V. My numerator is just the E to the RT. And then you see that the initial state is the logarithm of the stock. So for the S, you move to log S and the sigma squared. So the V is not transformed. Yeah? So you transform this S, but you do not transform the V yeah? because of this guy here. Yeah, then the drift is specified here. Okay, this is the R minus one half sigma squared. But now the sigma squared is my stochastic process. Yeah, So it's my V. Yeah? So this is actually R minus one half V. And this is the drift of the V part. So you see, I can now create many different model specifications where the model specification is here, the implementation of this interface. So this interface allows me to specify many different models. So if I have this model specification, now I would like to look at how I generate the time discrete stochastic process. So what is the implementation of this interface, the time discrete stochastic process? So let's have a look at this type hierarchy and you see there is, yeah, there is some interpolation guy, yeah, and, Somewhere here below there is the Euler scheme. So I have the Euler scheme and the Euler scheme takes now as an input in the constructor uh, two parts. It takes our model and it takes the independent increments. So this is our Brownian, Brownian motion, yeah, the stochastic driver. 
And then I do lazy initialization. So this is the implementation of give me the X tilde. Yeah? So the X tilde will be generated once you first ask for this. Yeah? So there's lazy initialization here. So we calculate this in this do pre-calculate process, which is here below. So there you see, what do we do? I have a loop over all time steps. Okay, I ask the time discretization, what is the delta T? I ask for the drift, and if you take a look here, it get drift, it's always delegating to the model, yeah? Ask the model for the drift, and when you ask the model for the drift, pass the time discretization that you have done so far, so pass this um, Euler discretization here. So then we have the drift, yeah? Then I ask my model give me the factor loadings, which is here. Yeah? Also the factor loadings just delegate to the model. Yeah? The model give me please the lambda. I ask for this. Then I multiply these factor loadings with my Brownian increment. So actually this here is a sum product. So this is a scalar product because this is a vector and this is a vector of random variables. So my Brownian increment is here. This was fetched here, my Brownian increment. So this is my lambda times delta W. I add this to the current state, uh, and I also add the drift times delta T to the current state, and that is the next state. So this generates the Ys for every time step, and the X is, of course, generated by applying the state space transform. Yeah? So this is the F of Y. Uh, F of the current state. So you see this here is the Euler scheme. Uh, there is a little bit other code around here because I'm doing multi-threading or I have the option to do this multi-threaded. Yeah? So simulate the process in parallel on different uh, processors. So let's ignore that. But there's another interesting thing here. I do a predictor corrector scheme. I do a corrector step here. So there is here and if, yeah, so if we would like to have the Euler scheme with predictor corrector step, yeah, with corrector step, then do something in addition. And if you now recall, so this here is our Euler scheme, yeah. So what was the predictor corrector scheme? It's a completely different scheme. Well, not completely, because we had a small remark that the predictor corrector scheme can be understood as a, just a correction to the drift. Huh? So that was actually here. So this is now our predictor corrector scheme. So it looks a little bit involved. But we had this nice remark that we just have a correction term to the Euler step. So we have this correction term that is applied to the x tilde star here. And the x tilde star, this is just an Euler step, yeah, the predictor step. And the correction is remove one half of the drift that you have used and add one half of the drift function with the new value. So that's maybe easy to implement, and I do it here. Yeah? So I just go here and I take my state variable and I add to the state variable the drift adjustment and the drift adjustment is the drift with the current component minus the drift without the predictor step yeah multiplied with one half yeah so one half the drift with the new value uh, minus one half the drift that was calculated before. The drift that was calculated before is just the drift that I have calculated. That's the reason why I'm calculating it a little bit on top yeah, before. And this drift here is just apply the drift function again. So I just call my model again. Hey, model, I have a new value here of my process. Yeah, What is the drift if you have that value? That's an easy uh easy win here to have an Euler scheme that also does um, a corrector step. Okay, so we have the implementation of the process. Yeah, so now we have the time discrete stochastic process. Okay, I like to show you one little thing. 
And this goes back to this remark that we could have the case where the Dobarea depends on the stochastic process. Uh, that you can also have in the case of the Black Schultz model. This is maybe not so well known, yeah, but you can specify the Black Schultz model in the following form. So you have ds is rs dt plus sigma s dw. And maybe you have the bank account. The bank account is db is rb dt. But now you take as numerea the s. You take the stock as the numerea. That's also uh, easily possible. Um, yeah. How do you derive the drift? Yeah. So the drift is in this case not R, because this R here is related to taking B as numerea. So let's write here the mu. So what is the mu? Well, the drift mu is derived from assets divided by the numerea should be martingales. If B is the numerea, it is S divided by B is a martingale. Well, if S is the numerator, it is S divided by S is a martingale. That is fulfilled by definition. S divided by S is just one, is a martingale. So the condition is something else. Yeah, the condition is B divided by the numerator is a martingale. So my condition is that DB divided by S is a zero DT plus something. Yeah, and now maybe you know that D B divided by S. Okay, this is B divided by S. So now you have to do a little bit Ito's lemma. Yeah. So this is D B divided by B. This is R minus D S divided by S. This is mu, R minus mu. But then we have also second order terms yeah, because we are differentiating one divided by S. Yeah? And the second order terms are now minus db divided by b multiplied with d, ds divided by s. This is actually rdt multiplied with sigma dw. This is a zero. And then it is a plus ds divided by s times ds divided by s. So this is sigma dw times sigma dw. This is a sigma squared dt. So this is an r minus mu plus sigma squared dt. So you see that mu is actually r plus sigma squared. So I have a Black Schultz model implementation that uses this. And this I would like to show you. So let's go into our process models type hierarchy. So you see there is the Black Schultz model here, but there's also the Black Schultz model with stock numerea. Okay, if you search for them, these two guys are here. So I can maybe just look at the difference of the Black Schultz model and that other one. So let's compare these two implementations. So you see here is a small note that is referencing this thing from the Ito's lemma. And you see this changes the drift. Instead of mu is r minus one half sigma squared, the minus one half sigma squared comes from moving to the logarithm. I now have mu is r plus one half sigma squared, which is the minus one half sigma squared plus sigma squared. So the drift is r plus one half sigma squared. So the remainder is the same, but I just have here a plus one half sigma squared instead of a minus for the drift. And I have now a different specification of the numerea. And here you see that my numerea is now calling back to the time discrete stochastic process and tells him, give me at the current time time index the value of the simulated S because my numerator is now the S. So just that you believe me, I have a small unit test. Here called Monte Carlo Black Scholes model test. 
And this unit test is actually running here my Black Schultz model. Okay. So it runs evaluation and compares it with the analytic value. So this is the analytic value. This is my Black Schultz model test. Actually, I have two different implementations. Yeah? So you can also increase the number of sample paths here. Okay. And maybe this is the first implementation here. This is the second implementation. They both give the same result. Maybe I change here the first one to this other Black Schultz model. So the Black Schultz model with stock numeraire. And you will see that this also gives now, if I feed it into my Euler scheme. So here you see, I take this model and I feed it into this Euler scheme together with a Brown in motion to generate now my Monte Carlo. So I get a different result, yeah, but also a very reasonable result. Yeah, Actually, it looks uh, better. Yeah? And maybe just that you see I'm not cheating here. If you go to the Black Schultz model, and if you change, for example, the drift of this model to R plus sigma squared divided by two, yeah, so R plus one half, yeah, and now you perform the valuation, you see you get an unreasonable result. Yeah? And if you now take as numeraire the stock, yeah, the valuation will be correct again. I just made this uh, little excursion here to see that I have designed everything, a lot of uh, in the direction designed for extension. Yeah? So, so everything is a little bit designed for extension. Yeah? The numeraire can de depend on the stochastic process. Yeah? And there's even a nice example for uh, the Black Schultz model where this could be the case. So now we have completed our hierarchy here. So we have our random variables, the time discretization, the Brown in motion that is on that time discretization generated, generating the corresponding random variables. I have a specification of my model yeah, and many different models that implement this specification. And from this, I now get the time discrete stochastic process using my Euler scheme. So I would like to have a last abstraction step. And this last abstraction step is that I have now many, many different models, but I would like to value many different financial products. Yeah? I would like to value a European option, an Asian option, and so on. So what we have done so far is building a Monte Carlo simulation of our model, the time discretization, the Brownian motion. They get, they generate random variables random variables in the Euler scheme once we provide our um, model specification. So I have here now the simulation of the X tilde uh, at certain times. But what I actually would like to have is that I would like to value financial products where I just ask, give me the value of the stock, give me the value of the numeraire, yeah? give me the value if it is an interest rate model of the forward rate and so on. So I would like to have another layer of abstraction where I could ask for the stock yeah? and the numeraire. And this layer of abstraction should be feeded into the financial products. So the next layer is that I have now my model and I would like to use this in a financial product. Let's do that in the next session. Yeah, It will be a short one, but then you will see that we now have a very flexible framework where we have many different model implementations Asian option, European option, Bermudan option, and many different models. Yeah? And we can interchange uh, everything. Yeah? And also many different numerical methods, yeah? like different random number generators, different 
time discretization schemes for the SDE, yeah, Euler, predictor, corrector, and we can interchange all the parts. That was it for today. <laughs>